going to talking about talk about the completion problem on totally positive matrices. Uh, so lucky for me, a lot of the definitions and uh, some of the past results that I'm going to use have been already introduced, like a few slides that uh, Rajesh had are exactly what I'd like to have in my slides. Uh, but I've, I've also put some of the definitions here just as a reminder. So um, for instance, with TPK here, we mean totally positive of order K, uh, and that is a matrix of any size, not necessarily square uh, of size M by N, so that all of the minors of uh, size at most K are positive. So that means uh, one by one entries, two by two minors, three by three, and all the way up to K by K are positive. And here by positive, we mean a strictly positive no, And having that, we also have the TP or totally positive matrix. Uh, which means all of the minors of any possible size are positive. And given that, uh, if we talk about a fixed set of totally positive matrices, then we have this nice uh, inclusion relationship between TPK matrices. Uh, as you see, TP is the most restricted one because all of the minors are positive. And then the next uh, most restricted one is TPM minus one. It's just missing the largest size. And going like that, the last one, which is the least restricted one, is TP1, which is just the entry-wise being positive. And then right before that is TP2, which means the one by one and two by two minors are positive. And that's what I'm going to talk about mostly. So um, some of the results that are useful here, again, these are mentioned several times in different talks. Uh, one of them is by Fikheta in 1912 that he said, well, just checking for TP2 through all minors is a lot of work. We don't want to do that. So there's a good news. And that is uh, we only need to check the contiguous ones. If all of the contiguous minors of size K or of size at most K are positive, that's enough to be TPK, which reduces the number of checks by a lot. But uh, later on, I think, uh, yeah, 80 years later, uh, Gasca and Pina, if I can pronounce it well, uh, showed that even that is too much. We can check even fewer minors. Those are called initial minors, which are um, the minors that, first of all, are contiguous. Secondly, uh, either the rows or columns start from the very first one. So the positivity of those minors, called initial minors, is enough to check for the positivity of the whole uh, set of minors. OK, very good. So. Um, as I said, the TP1 matrices are just a one by one uh, positive matrices. And if you're only wondering about the determinants, there isn't much more interesting in them. So the next interesting case to study in, in, um, in, a, in a goal of learning more about TPK matrices is TP2. So that's one reason those are interesting matrices. And another one is this result by Sean Fallot and Charles Johnson that says, if you start from a TP2 matrix and take its Hadamard exponents, not necessarily integer exponent, but any uh, Hadamard exponent, um, th then at some point, it becomes a TP matrix, some point and after that. And this is an if and only if condition. So that makes TP matrices by themselves even more interesting because uh, studying TP2 matrices are much easier than studying TP matrices. And we know that eventually they will become a TP matrix. Okay. And um, they are one that by themselves also very interesting. You will see some of the uh, results in the, here. So my goal for this talk is to first of all show you some combinatorial way of characterizing TP2 matrices. And then using that or generalizing that, we will see a complete solution to the TP2 completion problem. And then after that, I will show you some of the known results on the TP completion problem, not just TP2. So first of all, uh, how, how can we describe TP2 matrices using combinatorial methods? So for that, I need some notations. Uh, M sub pi, pi is a permutation here on let's say N uh, objects or N numbers, one to, through N. And M sub pi is a permutation matrix of that permutation, which means it gets one of the locations of I pi of I and zero everywhere else. So uh, it's just basically this si simple symmetric, uh, uh, not symmetric permutation matrix. And M sub pi of P and Q, by that we mean uh, in the permutation matrix, we look at the upper left corner uh, from row one to row P and column one to column Q. The number of ones in that upper left corner is simply M sub pi of P and Q. So like here, M sub pi of three and four is two because we only have two ones in there. Okay? So having that, uh, we can define Uruha order on permutations in two ways. 
which are really exactly the same things, but just looking at it differently. So one way is that um, writing the permutation in a sequence of numbers, the i location shows the p of i, basically, mm -hmm. i of i. And uh, we need transposition here, which means if you look at the locations i and j, if i is less than j, and at the same time, pi of i is less than pi of j, you can just switch those two. You will get a new permutation. That permutation is going to be larger than or equal to the older permutation in terms of Bruhai inequality, partial order on permutation. So let me explain that with an example. So if you look at that sigma, ah, sorry, how do I point? Huh? How do I point? Oh, okay, so fine. So if you look at that permutation, one and five, one is to the left of five, also one is less than five. We can switch one and five. And that was, that's what we will get, which is also a permutation. This permutation is larger than the Bruja inequality. And we can do keep doing it each time we get a larger permutation. So like here, um, three and four, three is to the left of four, and three is less than four. So we can switch those to get that new permutation, which is larger than the previous one in Bruja inequality. So that's Bruja in terms of just writing the sequence of numbers. But another way of describing the exact same thing is using the permutation matrix which says, if you look at the permutation matrices, uh, I'm, much, I'm being much better with hands. If you look at the permutation matrices, um, that is equivalent to saying that in every upper left corner of M sub sigma, the number of ones for sigma is at least the number of ones for, that has to be true for every upper left corner. And that comes exactly from that because there, are, when we say I is less than J, that means rho I is above rho J. And we say pi of i is less than pi of j. We mean pi of i is in the left column of pi of j. And when, when you look at it, you get ones like this. And if you look at the two by two submatrix, ones on, are on the main diagonal entry of that two by two submatrix. The Bruja order says you just switch these two to ones on the off diagonal entry of the two by two submatrix, which is really just a two by two determinant if you think about it. So. Um, so these are exactly the same definitions. For us, what we are going to do is to generalize both of these to uh, uh, or, uh, or different orders of permutations in order to say things about the QP2 matrix. So uh, how do we do that? Uh, we are defining this new uh, partial order on permutations using the TP2 matrix. So first of all, I need that, that notation A sub pi. And by that, we mean the product of the entries corresponding to pi pi. So like in this case, the permutation is three, one, two. And then we look at all the uh, matrices corresponding to those, which are the gray matrices, uh, gray entries, and then multiply them, that's A sub pi. Okay, so how do we define the permutation uh, inequality of using the TP2 matrices? We say pi is less than sigma in partial TP2 order if for every TP2 matrix of size n, so square this time, the product of the entries corresponding to pi is at least the product of the entries corresponding to sigma. So just by looking at it, it's a definition. It's a perfectly well-defined partial order. However, it's too much, right? Like it has to be true for every uh, TP2 matrix of order n. And obviously it's not possible to check every TP2 matrix and then this inequality on that. Right, but, but it is going to be extremely helpful. So even though the definition looks like a, it's not very clear, uh, but it is going to be very helpful. <laughs> Questions so far? Yeah. Oh, I thought you have a question. So this is a genuine partial order as well. Sorry? It's clearly transitive, it's reflexive, and it is anti-symmetric as well. Is it anti-symmetric? Sorry. Yes. Um, Because we, we, we only have one of these directions. Distinct. Okay, so keep these two orders in mind. Uh, but your TP again was strict total positive. Sorry? Yes, it's totally positive. Very good. <laughs> we want to say they're almost the same. That we, one implies the reverse of the other, and therefore they're really just the same partial orders. And the reason for that. Uh, it's an if and only definition, right? So to, sh to show that if sigma is less than pi in Bruja inequality, uh, then pi is less than sigma in TP2, that's just a definition of having TP2 by two minus to be positive. 
So uh, that's not hard. The harder case is this one that I'm going to explain. So let's say pi is less than sigma in uh, TP2 partial order. We want to say sigma is less than pi in Bruja partial order. And let's say it's not. If it's not, using the definition, what that means is that in the permutation, <laughs> there is an upper left corner so that the number of ones for sigma is strictly less than the number of ones for pi in that upper left corner. So let's say that upper left corner is surrounded by row P and column Q. So using those P and Q, we construct this matrix. So here's row P, and then that's row Q. And uh, what we do is to put twos all the way here. J is the all ones matrix, and then ones for the rest of the matrix. Was my question, right? Sorry? This is TN2. Exactly. This is TN2. Well, then you but do this. There have been many statements in these talks. Yes. T and Ks are dense in TP case. So that means I can perturb the entries of this matrix by small amount so that it becomes TP2. And because this inequality is strict, I can perturb it small enough so that it's still, the inequality is still holding. Therefore, that's a contradiction for our assumption. And that means um, these two inequalities are, in fact, the same. Very good. So we showed that those three inequalities are the same, which means we can actually define TP2 in a different way. And uh, that is, if we have a positive matrix, that's not positive definite, that's entry-wise positive. If you have a positive matrix, uh, then the matrix is TP2, if and only if, whenever we have two permutations with the Bruja inequality, this product holds for them. The product of the entries corresponding to pi is less than the product of the entries corresponding to sigma. Which you might say, okay, this is harder than the, just the definition of TP2, right? Because for TP2, we just need to check two by two minors. But again, it's going to be extremely helpful in solving the uh, TP2 completion problem. We will generalize these in a minute. So, so, so far, I just showed you that new kind of definition of the TP2 matrices. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the completion problem, and then I will show you the complete solution to the TP2 completion problem. So, first of all, what's a partial matrix? A partial matrix means a matrix when we have some of the uh, entries, we call them specified entries, and we don't have all, all of them. So those unknown ones, we call them unspecified entries. And partial TP2 matrix is a, first of all, partial matrix, uh, so that the known part satisfy um, being TP2. So that means the entries are positive when, whenever they are known, and two by two submatrices, whenever they are completely known, they are also positive. Like this example, the two by two submatrix has a positive determinant, and there's only another fully specified two by two submatrix, which also has a positive determinant. Uh, everything else is either positive or unknown. Okay. So having that, uh, we have the completion problem, which says, okay, in general, completion problem says I have an object that I know, I don't know all of it, but I want to uh, fill in uh, the parts that I don't know so that it satisfies some desired properties. In the TP2 case, it will mean that we have a partial TP2 matrix, and we want to replace the unspecified entries with values so that it becomes a TP2 matrix, right? So uh, how do we do this? Well, in this example, I can do it because I can replace um, those unspecified entries with the red values, and it's not hard to check that this is a TP2 matrix. Well, of course, uh, the question becomes in general, we don't want to just work on a specific case. So that means we are going to look at the pattern of the specified entries and answer the question of, um, can I complete it uh, regardless of the values of the specified entries or not? So that's called the TP2 completion problem. So uh, let's look at an example that I cannot complete it. So like in this case, if you look at the X here, that's an unspecified entry, X together with the red entries, four, eight, four, will give me the uh, upper bound of two, and X together with this blue entries, the two by two submatrix in there, four, nine, nine, will give me the lower bound of four. Obviously there is no such X. That means I cannot complete this matrix. So this specific matrix is not TP2 completable, which means this pattern is not TP2. Okay. So why completion in general? Um, there are several applications of the completion problem. I'm explaining only one of them here, just briefly, not in details. And uh, that is uh, showing up in the collaborative filtering and uh, recommendation systems. So I think at some point, Netflix introduced this prize that based on 
the people who watch the movies and rate them based on their ratings, Netflix wanted to recommend some new movies to the customers. If you watch these movies and like them, then you might like this one too. And we see this, this happens all the time in the shopping carts right now, right? Like the Amazon, all the other shopping websites do that. So Netflix wanted to get the best algorithm to recommend in the best way to the customers that if you like movies X, Y, Z, then you might like this one too. And the method for this is using this matrix that every row corresponds to a customer. So one of the people who watches the movie and every column corresponds to the movies in the case of Netflix. And the entries are going to be some integers, excuse me, integers from one to five. One being, I hated this movie. Uh, five being, I love this movie. And uh, of course, not everyone can watch all of the movies. So there are lots of unknown entries in that matrix. And the question is, how can those unknown entries be rated, uh, be replaced with values from one to five, given the rest of the information? So that's exactly a completion problem. And um, I don't know much about it, but I think in a lot of the cases, this type of problem becomes simply a rank completion problem. So you want the matrix to have a low rank and the question is based on those entries, how can we make it to be a low rank? And uh, there are different methods that I don't know the details, but in general, completion problem has applications like that and it has been studied for several cases. In fact, Dominic explained one case yesterday in his uh, slides, right? There was a three by three sub matrix and you filled it uh, the first and uh, first row and column to complete it for a positive semi-definite matrix. So um, there are lots of studies in this area. And from my understanding, the only case that's completely solved is the M matrix. And um, that is due to a simple fact that if you replace the unspecified entries with zero, we can easily check whether it's an M matrix or not, and that answers the question. The rest of it, there are lots of results, but there is no uh, complete solution. And I haven't listed everything here. There are more than that. Should I ask you what an M matrix is? Or will that take us too far from? No, it's just a, a matrix with non positive off diagonal entries, and it has a lot of equivalent definitions too. So you can think about it as um, identity minus S times a matrix where all of the off diagonal entries are um, positive, depending on the size of this. So there are, there are different, there are like, like positive semi definitions, they have many equivalent definitions too. So I don't know if I gave the best definition. So they have like uh, much more. Uh, Tuplets, Hunker, there, there were many studies of completing tuplets matrices. Okay, yeah. Bounds, bounds or positivity or hunger. And, uh, so the, some of the people here and others. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know about that. Thank you. Okay. So now uh, back to the TP2 case. So now I'm going to show you the solution for the TP2 completion. And we will go back to that Bruja and generalize uh, and the TP2 order that we defined on the uh, partial and uh, uh, the permutations and generalize them. So this is simply the generalization of the Bruja order and permutation matrices. So there we only had zero one matrices. Here we are going to look at the non-negative matrices. And we're going to, um, so <laughs> let me just define it first. So A doubly matrizes B if it satisfies these three conditions. Uh, the first one is that they have non-negative entries. Secondly, the row sums and column sums are exactly the same. And finally, the sums of the entries in every upper left corner of A must be at least the sums of the entries in every upper in the corresponding upper left corner of B. That's exactly saying the number of ones in the permutation matrix. matrix right? So uh, if we move lexicographically from the one one entry, each time I add the entries for A, I must get at least uh, a bigger, a bigger number or equal to number um, in the matrix B. So the, if, we, if this happens, we say A doubly matrices B, which as you see is just a generalization of the Bruja inequality. And I'm sk skipping a lot of the steps here. Uh, so what happens behind this is that we generalize the TP2 order that I defined as well to uh, as something we call it the larger TP2 matrix. And Using all of that, we give the solution to the, to the TP2 completion, which says, if I start with a partial matrix, which has positive entries, and now I'm not even talking about partial TP2, just a positive entry, positive specified, and it has a TP2 completion, if and only if these inequalities hold. 
Now, what are these inequalities? We take the specified entries and find the exponent of them to the corresponding entries of matrix A. And similarly for matrix B, for any pair of uh, matrices and B when A doubly majorizes B. So, um, so it gives an if and only if condition and it solves the problem, right? So every time we have a, uh, a pair of matrices A and B with the same size of partial matrix uh, E, we take the exponents of the specified entries to the corresponding entries of A and B. If these inequalities hold for all of them, then it has a TP2 completion. And could we check this? Sorry? Could we check this? Exactly. Reality? When you look at it, it's an if and only if condition, but it's not really practical or anything like that, right? So it's a very difficult condition. So the next question is, can we make this something meaningful? And uh, can we actually make the conditions um, optimal? This seems too many. And the answer is yes. Uh, but let me explain what that means in this example, and then we'll get there. So what that means in this example is that that's, the T is my partial TP matrix. The known entries are all positive. And I take them to the exponent of A and B, where as you see, A doubly majorizes B. There are only three non-zero entries, and that's not hard to check. So what those inequalities mean here is that the blue entries to the exponent of their corresponding entries must be at least the red entries to the exponent of corresponding entries. And obviously that's not true, which means this matrix doesn't have a GP2 completion, which is exactly the same matrix as before, there we check that these um, the two by two minors here, we get that from our if and only if condition. <laughs> so, okay, the, that doesn't have a TP2 completion, but again, how do we uh, um, optimize our if and only if condition? So I have this here one more time, just to look at it. See that this is really, uh, it is a solution, but it's not really a solution in the sense that you can't do much with it. So what are we going to do with this? So if you look at A and B, saying A doubly majorizes B is the same as saying A minus K doubly majorizes uh, zero matrix. That's what we are going to use. So A minus B doubly majorizes the zero matrix. We are going to replace the unspecified entries with the zeros and write the matrices that come from doubly majorizing zero. So what does that mean? Well, first of all, the unspecified entries are zero. If you think about doubly majorizing one more time, there we said the two matrices have equal liberal sums and column sums. In that case, when we doubly majorize zero, it means the row sums and the column sums must be zero. That's exactly where these two come from. And also there we said the sum of the entries of A in every upper left corner must beat the sum of the entries of B. When we subtract, that simply means the sum of the entries must be at least zero for every upper left corner. So those are these basically. So we really wrote those uh, conditions and it turns out that that's actually a cone, which is wonderful. It's going to be really, really helpful in this case. So let's look at this example. Um, we replace the unspecified entries with zeros. And then if that one gets a variable of x1 and that one x2, this is the last unknown entry. So that has to be the negative of the sum of the previous ones. And similarly for columns, if that's x1, that's x6. This has to be the negative of some of the previous ones to make row sums and column sums to be zero. And that's a form of the matrix that I get with doing all of these. Now we need to check those upper left inequalities, which is basically these inequalities. So um, from uh, one one entry, if you move at lexicographically and write all of the uh, sums of the entries must be at least zero, these are what we get, which as you see, they're simply hyperplanes, uh, sorry, half planes. And that's simply cone. So, and not only cone, but a polyhedral cone and pointed, which is fantastic because it means we have unique minimal and moreover integral set of generators. So, unique means we will get a unique set of solutions, not those infinitely many that we had in the and only condition. Minimal means it will be optimal solution. And integral means the polynomials that we will get have integer exponents, not any kind of. So, so it couldn't get better, really. So we can come back and write our if and only condition using the cone language, which is really just the same things I just wrote it in terms of cone. But even better, we can write it in terms of the generators of the cone, because if, if the inequalities hold for the generators of the cone, it will hold for everything. So, so that means 
uh, the TP2 completion problem is completely solved by giving the uh, minimal set of uh, solutions in order to have a completion. There's one more thing left, and that is, okay, these are the conditions, but how do I find them? Okay. So if you give me a pattern, can I actually give you the explicit conditions that if the pattern satisfies those, then there is a completion. And luckily, there's a solution for that too. And that comes from Fukuda's uh, linear programming. So Fukuda is, um, has this program, and uh, it was in CDD plus for a while, I don't know if he has changed it, that if you give the uh, half planes like these, uh, as a cone, and it will give you the minimal set of um, generators for the cone. And that's what I did. So if you give the matrix in, uh, the inequalities in that matrix format, um, this is what Fukuda gives. Every row is a generator for that cone. So like 0, 0, 0, 1, minus 1, 1 is one of the generators and so on. And now how do I turn this back into conditions for our solution? We take each of these generators and plug it back in the X matrix. So let's take the first one, 0, 0, 0, 1, minus 1, 1. And that means our variables are like this. X1 is 0, X2 is 0, and so on. And then we plug it back in the matrix. That is what we get. Oh, sorry. And that G1 is what we get as one of the generators, basically. So that is going to give me the one of the inequalities, which means the specified entries of the TP2, partial TP2 matrix with the exponents of those ones or negative ones must be at least one. That was our condition, right? So that's one of the inequalities that we get. The specified entries to the corresponding entry, uh, to the corresponding entries in that generator must satisfy this inequality, which gives me exactly that. So we do this for each of the generators obtained from Fukuda's program. And that's exactly going to be the set of conditions that we need for a pattern to have a TP2 completion. Okay, so this really completely solves the TP2 completion problem. We were able to optimize it and we were able to provide an algorithm to uh, solve it. Questions so far? Okay, so now the question is, okay, what about other cases, right? TP3, TP4, or is uh, it gets really hard when we think about the uh, TP cases, because yeah, like, there's so many determinants to check and the polynomials that we study are, um, it can get really ugly. So uh, I have a list of some of the results that are not, obviously the list is not complete, but the, the, the thing is, even though it has been studied with several people, it's not, there's no complete set of solutions. So the solutions are like here and there are things, there's no um, answer for a fixed problem. So one of the recent, uh, the recent, I mean, early, early in the study of TP completion problems is this paper with Sean Powell, Charles Johnson, and uh, Ron Smith. By the way, Ron Smith unfortunately passed away this October. Um, but um, anyways, at the, they studied the TP completion problem with only one unspecified entry, and the, one of the results that they have is that if the unique unspecified entry lies in any of these corners, so uh, either those six entries or this, these ones, then there's definitely a TP completion, regardless of the values of the specified entries. Otherwise, there's there are restrictions and we cannot complete them unless it satisfies those conditions that they, they didn't provide the conditions. Right, so that's one of the results. Another result is that when uh, I was in William and Mary uh, with some RE students, uh, Victoria Aiken, I uh, studied this case when um, there's only one unspecified entry. It's like the previous paper. But this time for all TPKs, not just a TP. And we were able to provide determinantal relationships between the minors. This is something similar to what Pratik was doing or projection, the sign regular cases, to find relationships between minors that give us uh, the lower bonds and upper bonds that without working. Uh, too much on the uh, unspecified entry, we can say there is a gap so that we can fill it in. So that was one of the, um, the, the, the determinantal relationships that we found and it was extremely helpful. And using that, we were able to prove that it is TPK completable if and only if the similar statement for the previous paper holds. So we will also be uh, able to provide all the conditions that I have on listed here, it gets too many at some point. So that's one of the results. Now, meaning that for for every matrix, uh, 
this... every partial TPK matrix if the unspecified entries because rely on those moves. For some special, it can be completable, yes? Yes, as long as there's only one unspecified entry. Yes. <clears throat> but if if you have only one unspecified entry, there is a, a matrix that is complete. Then as long as it means that for for every for every TP or TPK matrix yes. with uh, this uh, yes exactly when it says TPT TPK complete it means for all for all uh, specific cases of the pattern it is complete right. okay perfect so now uh, in a very recent paper Johnson and Carter studied this case when the matrix has only size three by n, so three rows, any number of columns, and they provided that as long as it's not one of these patterns, there's always a completion. And uh, there are 13 of them. Uh, how do you find them? They, they I think, wrote a, a program and found that with these, you must satisfy some constraints. Without these, it's going to be completable regardless. So that's a very nice result. And uh, Recently, uh, last year actually, not that summer, but the past summer, I decided to go back to this because when you look at these cases or even any of the previous cases, uh, this even came in Projesh's talk. Yeah. When you have a partial TPK matrix, we can always insert a row or column of unspecified entries and complete it. And by row or column, when you think about it, the specified entries are lying horizontally or vertically, and when you write the determinant, they uh, affect each other by addition or subtraction. But when they come like these, when they, they appear diagonally towards each other, and when you look at the determinant, they're actually multiplied by each other. And that makes it really hard to find the lower bonds or upper bonds that they are looking for. And that means when we have the unspecified entries lying on the diagonal entry, it's going to be really hard. So I asked my RU students uh, in the summer of 2023 to check the cases when the unspecified entries lie diagonally, but then add a condition to make it a bit simpler. And that condition was that the matrix is symmetric. So that reduces the number of variables by a lot because we have half the number of entries, right? So we use uh, Sylvester's inequality a lot, which is Inequality that I wrote, it relates the uh, determinant in a very really nice way. That, uh, but the simple way of seeing that is that if you have matrices in, um, uh, in order without worrying about alpha one, alpha two, if you have matrices in uh, blocks of block one, one, block one, two, block one, three, uh, block two, one, and block two, two, you just find the determinant using um, a very similar way of finding the determinant of two by two, but just with those. Uh, blocks. So having that, we were able to create more uh, relationships between determinants. One of them is this one. There are a few more that I haven't listed all. And using that, we were able to give some answers to the case of having unspecified entries on their diagonal positions, uh, but um, in the case of symmetric, of course. So these, these cases are kind of <clears throat> easy. So I, I've just listed them there. If you have one, that's Extremely easy, you just need to make it as large as possible. If you have two unspecified entries, that's coming from the uh, result by Fowler, Johnson, and Smith. And if you have three entries, then it, again, we can show that that's also possible. So those are good. But now when we move to four unspecified entries, and again, this is a symmetric case, it's not going to be true for non-symmetric cases, we were able to show that as long as these inequalities hold, everything is good. And what are these inequalities? By, by this arrow, we mean that's a lower bound for the variable. Uh, by this arrow, we mean that's an upper bound for this variable. So the lower bound is a strictly less than upper bound, which means there's a gap in there and we can fill it. And if these three hold, then it's completable. Otherwise, it's not. When we move, uh, and these are the minors, by the way. So those three inequalities that I had uh, are corresponding to these minors. So, so that's basically the whole, um, the whole of TP completion problem. Find the relationships between minors and this is one of them. Now, when we move to so to fill in, uh, yeah, to fill in that fourth question mark, yeah, we need three inequalities to be satisfied. Exactly, which are these minors? So I'm hoping actually you see these as 
the relationships that you were having in your slides, because there you have scanned a type. But then these are not in products of miners, right? Yeah, no, they are not. So, well. Yeah, there's one minor, less than one minor. Or even worse, right? Like in this one, difference of minors. Difference of product of minors is like this. This fine. Yeah, this is similar, right? This is fine. This yeah. is okay. So I'm hoping that you will see these. You will see some relationships here within this and your work. Right, very good. So now, um, the, the case of orange spider trees, not too bad either. They gets really ugly when we think about the five unspecified entries all on diagonal cases. So even in the six by six matrix, my REU students spend the whole two, month, uh, two months on um, basically this one. Um, there are a bunch of inequalities that I have written here for that. I uh, skip them because they're very, they're kind of nice, similar to the four by four, four unspecified entries case. It's this one that gets really ugly. And the reason for that is that if we consider the four, four, specified for just a minute and look at the five, five unspecified entry, then that means this inequality must hold. The lower bound uh, obtained from those rows and columns must be the upper bound from obtained, uh, obtained from those rows and columns. And now we go back to that and expand it, replacing the uh, unspecified entry with zero. And this is what we get. So now here, note that the five, five entry was unspecified, right? So we go back and write that as a variable, and then we get these inequalities, and then we expand it, and it, it gives us, I didn't write it because it's really ugly, but if you just rearrange these and solve it for y, we get this quadratic equation in terms of all those minors, so B, A, C, or in terms of those minors, and we must have this inequality true in order to have a completion. And we were trying a lot to see this in a nicer combinatorial way, but we haven't been able to do that. So. Um, that's one of the things that, um, that the case about the completion problems. If you want to see the combinatorially, sometimes it's really nice. Sometimes I don't see a way of doing it. So I'm hoping that uh, with your works, you can tell me some nice way of seeing this, which I'm not able to. And um, using that, we were able to give this table that so far we know what the result is for the symmetric case with unspecified entries lying on the diagonal entries. Uh, for uh, n is the number of rows or columns, it's, the, it's a square matrix. K is the number of unspecified entries. As you see, for six by six, we know until five entries, assuming that inequality is good, but for seven by seven, <laughs> we have to check out most seven, 47 conditions. And um, it becomes really ugly at some point. For, for eight by eight, we have to check out most 60 conditions. I don't know if 45 conditions are minimal or not. That's another thing. Um, but yeah, that's where we are now. So this is the information that we have at this point. So having that, th this is my talk. Thank you all for listening. I want to take the minute and commercialize for a second. I am the chair of the uh, membership committee of this wonderful society called International Linear Algebra Society, which I'm sure most of you know about it, and uh, ILAS basically. It is, uh, from my understanding, one of the biggest societies in mathematics in the world. And it's a very, very friendly society. It's extremely uh, nice in a lot of ways. Uh, they, uh, not only there are conferences, the next one is in, the, in Taiwan in June 23, 27, but also they provide support to many things, such as uh, conferences. And I think they have uh, $1,000 support to uh, conferences. They also provide support to people with financial difficulty. Uh, like last time, they provided support to a person who had flown one of the war zones um, and wanted to attend the conference. They do a lot of good stuff. Um, and membership fee is only $40 for dollars, US dollars, not Euro, so much less for Europeans, um, um, for faculty member and free for students. Uh, so please join if you can. It's a really, really good society. Thank you for listening. and. Uh,